Hey everyone, welcome back. Today, we're diving into part 3 of Son of Thor. Full credit goes to the author. Check the description for more details and a link to the story so you can read along. We're tackling chapter 5 and 6 in this episode. Don't forget to hit that like button and drop a comment to support the channel. It really helps out. Let's jump into the story. What kind of powers do you think Naruto has? Asked Nico as everyone began sitting down in the arena, eager to see the demigod who would be fighting Talia. Well, Thor's the god of thunder, isn't he? So he has control over lightning. What else would he have? Bianca said, figuring that having control over lightning would be enough of a power. He's also the god of strength, storms, consecration, and fertility. It's likely Naruto would have control over storms too, along with being very strong, said Annabeth, intrigued to see what Naruto is capable of, aside from what they've already seen and heard of his training. Would he really be that strong? Questioned Bianca, unsure just how powerful Naruto could be with the abilities he inherited from his father. I honestly have no idea. There are times when demigods won't inherit all the abilities that their godly parent has, but it's clear he does have power over lightning. But I don't know what else Naruto could have, not counting that he was personally trained by his father, which likely means he has far more control over his power, Annabeth replied, having no idea what level Naruto could be at when compared to Talia. Given how Talia had always been a natural fighter, even by demigod standards, along with gaining experience during their time on the run, and after being freed from her tree, she also showed to be a quick learner, especially with her control over the mist. While Naruto, on the other hand, had years of training with his divine family, and from what he told them of his training, he's been thrown into dozens of dangerous and life-threatening situations, giving him not just training, but experience against things none of them have faced before, including gods that lived for fighting and killing. The daughter of Athena wanted to have faith in her friend, but even she wasn't entirely sure Talia would be able to beat the whiskered redhead. Across from where the demigods were sitting were the hunters and Artemis, with the hunters unable to deny their interest in seeing a fight between the daughter of Zeus and the son of Thor. Are you still angry at what the kitty said? Andromeda asked while looking at Zoe, who had been scowling since they arrived at the arena. I couldn't care less what that boy has said, no matter how grating. I am annoyed that Lady Artemis is being forced to remain at this camp rather than hunting the monster she has been tracking, said Zoe not liking how their mistress is being reduced to essentially babysit someone, especially when it's a boy of all things. Let it go, Zoe. What's done is done, and nothing I can do will change it. Besides, Apollo is aware of the danger this monster brings and will ensure it's dealt with. And while I may not enjoy my new duty, I do enjoy the chance to help in training my hunters without worry of any attack. As well as getting Andromeda caught up, said Artemis, smiling at her hunters, knowing it will be a good opportunity to train with them some more and help Andromeda in her own training. With her words making the hunters happy for the chance to spend more time with their mistress outside of hunting. Before a few looked down into the arena, curiously then back to Artemis. Lady Artemis, do you know Thor? One of the hunters asked, wondering if she's ever encountered the god of thunder before, while the moon goddess inhaled sharply before releasing her breath. No, not personally. I only ever know of him through his reputation, and he doesn't have the best reputation. What's known to everyone is that he loves fighting and killing having done it enough that he's widely regarded as the biggest butchering bastard in the Nine Realms. Though it's meant as an insult, I'm sure he'd consider it a compliment. He's also known to drink a lot, far more than even Dionysus, said Artemis, much to some of the hunter's shock and the disgust of others. Then he's no different from any other man. Only knowing how to kill and destroy, said Phoebe, several hunters nodded in agreement. Perhaps. But he has also earned a reputation to be feared and revered. Regardless of his personality, the god of thunder isn't one to be trifled with unless you desire a painful death, Artemis said, causing some of the hunters to shiver while Andromeda frowned before glancing down at the arena. What do you think he's like, compared to his dad? questioned Andromeda, making Artemis frown in thought. I don't know. I can only go off what we have seen of Naruto Uzumaki. Aside from his desire to be a constant annoyance and antagonize anyone he pleases, he seems at least slightly tolerable. But there's no telling what he was like with the rest of his kind, Artemis said willing to admit that Uzumaki seemed like a good person with how he cares for his friends. But given her knowledge of the Asser, Artemis doubted that's all there was to him, combined with being trained by Thor and the rest of his family. The moon goddess was sure he had the same love of battle and bloodlust his father is known for but was good at hiding it. And if what he did to the manticore is any indication, he can be cruel when he wants to, Artemis thought while frowning slightly, wondering what it'd take to make him lose control. While in their own booth, Chiron and Dionysus looked down at the arena in interest for the match, the former more than the latter, with the god of wine giving more attention to his can of Diet Coke, occasionally glancing around the arena. Mr. D, what do you think of this boy, a child of Thor? Chiron asked, unable to help but feel a little nervous at an Asir being in Camp Half-Blood. The trainer of heroes was aware of the existence of the other pantheons, even having some friends among them, 
including the Norse. Having met Mimir, the Norse god of wisdom and knowledge, before he was imprisoned by Odin. So Chiron was aware of the reputation of the Asur tribe, their bloodlust, arrogance, cruelty, and even the sadism of the more twisted ones. And even if Naruto is just a demigod, he was a demigod of Thor himself, who wasn't only the second strongest and physically strongest of the Asur, but the one everyone feared and wouldn't dare challenge. Well, no one's died yet, so I suppose that's a positive, said Dionysus, knowing if he was the same as his father, he would have already started killing everyone. And should he prove to be like his father and go after someone? said Chiron, making Dionysus look at him with a rare, deadly serious expression. Then they better hope they die quickly, Dionysus replied, as that'd be the only mercy they could hope for from an Asser, a quick death. Everyone's attention then turned towards the arena as Naruto and Talia arrived, getting several girls and a few boys to look at the Uzumaki eagerly. Oh my, it's been a while since we had such a handsome guy show up, Drew Tanaka, a daughter of Aphrodite, said while eagerly taking in Naruto's appearance and physique. Don't even think about it, Drew. Silena said, giving her sister a warning look, doubting that Naruto would be the kind of guy she could make fall in love with her, and then break his heart and not expect him to retaliate for being manipulated. Not to mention how she saw the way Annabeth and Talia both acted when they came by the Pegasi stables, along with how close he already seems to be with Bianca. Plus, Silena already intended to stake her own claim, and while she was nicer than some of her siblings, she also had the same possessiveness when it came to seeing a guy she's interested in, and she had no intentions of letting any of her siblings try anything. Too late. I'm already thinking of a lot of things. And as far as I can see, the new cutie is available, Drew said with a smirk, only to suddenly feel a shiver go down her spine and someone looking at her. Looking at where the feeling was coming from, Drew couldn't help but gulp at seeing Bianca giving her a friendly smile as the irises of her normally brown eyes turned a sulfuric golden yellow with pitch black scara. No, he isn't, stated Bianca, being able to guess the kind of girl Drew was just by looking at her and refused to let some petty, popular girl even think of manipulating her friend slash crush. You're doing it again, Bianca, Nico said with a small smirk, having seen Bianca act like this before whenever another girl got too friendly or close to Naruto and always enjoyed teasing her about being possessive over him. Doing what, Nico? Bianca asked, turning to her brother with her smile still present, causing the boy to instantly lower his head. Nothing, muttered Nico, knowing she can be scary when she wants to be. That's why you shouldn't try anything, Drew, Annabeth said giving the daughter of Aphrodite a dry look while Drew shivered and quickly looked away, not wanting to risk angering the daughter of Hades further. Though everyone was shocked when Dionysus made the announcement of Naruto's parentage, everyone aside from those who already knew being shocked his father is Thor, even more so at the knowledge other pantheons exist, given if the Norse gods are real than what other ones were. Before the fight then started, much to everyone's amazement as Naruto and Talia began fighting, even more so with how Naruto could recall his axe after throwing it only for several to become confused when he slammed his axe down and ice spikes emerged from the ground. How did he do that? Is creating ice some power that Thor has? Andromeda asked with a frown, having never heard anything of Thor possessing cryokinesis. It's not him creating the ice. While Thor is a god of storms and cryokinesis is an aspect of atmokinesis, the boy isn't the one creating the ice, himself, said Artemis, frowning while looking at the leviathan axe, sensing how the ice came from it. Is it the axe, my lady? Zoe asked while looking at the moon goddess, with Artemis nodding in response. Yes, whatever kind of weapon that is, it possesses a large amount of power within it, a cold and frozen power, Artemis replied, wondering where he could have gotten a weapon like that. As the fight continued, Bianca couldn't help but feel her eye begin twitching as Naruto and Talia kept bantering, even flirting with how they were talking. They don't even seem to realize what they're doing, Silena said, smiling in amusement, making Annabeth glance at her before turning back to the fight. Doing what? questioned Annabeth, unable to help but feel annoyed for some reason, which only made the Ravenette's smile grow more. I think I'll let it be a surprise. Use that big, pretty brain of yours, Annie, said Silena, fully aware of the annoyance Annabeth and Bianca were feeling and loving it. Whoa, Nico muttered as they saw storm clouds begin covering the sky, with lightning and thunder going off in them, only for everyone to quickly cover their ears when Naruto clapped his hands together, which sounded more like a clap of thunder and released a shockwave that threw Talia back with them covering their ears again when he did another clap, which thankfully wasn't as loud as the second one. Gods, is that boy trying to deafen us all? said Zoe in annoyance at the loud sound. What? Phoebe said, only able to hear the ringing in her ears at the moment. It'll fade after a while, girls, said Artemis, but would admit it was annoying having a clap of thunder go off like that, along with it being surprising that he could even do something like that. Though, when Talia brought a bolt of lightning down towards Naruto, only for him to throw the Leviathan axe, Everyone was shocked to see the lightning bolt be cut in half. Even more so, 
when he grabbed both halves and absorbed the lightning. Did he just? Chiron muttered in disbelief at seeing lightning be cut in half, while Dionysus idly waved his hand, putting a barrier over the arena, with Artemis doing the same. Cut lightning in half, grab it, and then absorb it. Yes, yes he did, Dionysus said boredly, though raised a brow at the unexpected feat. It only became more shocking when Talia called down more lightning, only for Naruto to seemingly take control of it from her and create a tornado of thunderclouds and lightning, making more than a few campers nervous that he was going to bring it crashing down on top of them. That's honestly unbelievable, said Annabeth in disbelief and nervousness, unsure if this really how strong Naruto is, or if he's just making a statement about how useless it is to use his own power against him. That's so awesome, Nico said, grinning in amazement that the whiskered redhead was capable of manipulating the weather like that. Wow, Bianca said, not believing how easily Naruto could do something like that, then just as easily dispersed the tornado. Artemis narrowed her eyes as she saw Naruto's body begin emitting lightning before he seemed to teleport away from Talia's attack, reappearing behind her, creating a whip of lightning that he wrapped around her spear. Did he just teleport? Andromeda asked with wide eyes, wondering how he could teleport like that. The boy didn't. My lady, said Zoe, turning towards Artemis, knowing he didn't teleport but couldn't figure out how he was able to move that fast. None of you would be able to follow it. He was using his lightning to augment his speed to the point that it looked like he teleported but was moving faster than anyone could comprehend. It also seems like he has mastery of lightning to the point he can shape and manipulate it however he pleases, said Artemis with a frown as Naruto condensed the lightning whip into a ball, which he threw at Talia as it grew and surrounded her. Everyone could tell the fight was over after this, but couldn't help but be worried when the ball was brought crashing into the ground, exploding in a blast of lightning and ice, with Talia seen lying on the ground, much to the concern of her friends, only being relieved to see she's still alive. He can use lightning to heal too, Annabeth said in disbelief when Naruto offered Talia his hand up, seeing electricity sparking off their hands as the daughter of Zeus' injuries faded away. He keeps getting more and more interesting, stated Silena with a small smirk, causing Bianca's eye to start twitching at her words, along with seeing how close Naruto and Talia were before she quickly made her way down into the arena, being followed by Nico and Annabeth. Silena was tempted to join them at hearing Naruto's offer of training, but first wanted to see for herself how the training would go before she joined. Though Clarice is really going to be upset that she wasn't here, thought Silena, knowing her best friend will hate how she wasn't here to see this and try challenging the son of Thor herself. Everyone then began clearing out of the arena, all the campers eagerly talking among themselves about the fight, along with how strong Naruto is. Later, Princess Andromeda. Meanwhile, on the Princess Andromeda cruise ship, the primary living space for the Titan army, Luke had just called a meeting after getting some news from his spies in Camp Half-Blood. News that made the son of Hermes nervous at what was to come. There's been news from Camp Half-Blood. We've learned that two new demigods have arrived, the ones the Manticore had been sent after. They've been claimed as the children of Hades, revealed Luke. Something that made the demigods nervous at having two more children of the big three to deal with. But that's not all. There's also another demigod, one that's already claimed but not by an Olympian or a minor god. Instead, they come from another pantheon. A Norse demigod and son of Thor, the god of thunder. And more than that, he's stronger than any other demigod there having already defeated Talia Grace, the daughter of Zeus, in a fight, Luke said, which really shocked the demigods, while a few minor gods tensed and looked nervous at this new development. Given how several of them were either old enough to know of Thor's reputation or heard of it, the power he possessed and the fear he could inspire, knowing that even when the Olympians were at the height of their power, he was capable of rivaling Zeus, the strongest of the gods. But now with the decline of their worship, Thor was now much stronger, making him even more fearsome. It honestly made some of them start to wonder if joining the Titans was a good idea, if it meant there was a chance they would go against the son of Thor or worse, if his father got involved. While the demigods were nervous with the knowledge they had of Thor in pop culture, given how powerful he's been depicted, it made plenty of them nervous at how powerful the real Thor could be compared to how he's portrayed in modern media. And now his son was at Camp Half-Blood, even more so that he was able to defeat Talia, who was one of the biggest obstacles in their way given her potential role in the Great Prophecy. Luke was also shocked to learn of this not only at the existence of other pantheons, but that Talia had been defeated. Having seen firsthand how strong his old friend was, even he's never been able to defeat her before. But now learning she's been defeated, seemingly with little effort from the son of Thor, it's concerning how powerful this new demigod could be. So what if there's a son of Thor? It just means we have some wannabe superhero to deal with now, too, said Alabaster C. Torrington, a son of Hecate, not seeing the issue of having one more demigod to deal with. You would be wise to watch your mouth, demigod, as well as who you underestimate, said a voice behind Luke, making the demigod freeze, already knowing who it is. Before he slowly turned his head to see the general of Kronos' army, Atlas, 
the titan of endurance. All of you would be wise to not underestimate a child of the Thunder God. Despite what mortals believe him to be like, the true Thor is far from some noble hero. Atlas sneered as he walked forward. To Thor, all of you would be little more than insects to be crushed. He wouldn't even need a reason. He would simply kill all of you because he could. The Olympians are even less to him. All it would take is a single swing of his hammer to bring Olympus crumbling down around them. He has slaughtered thousands, reveling in the destruction and death he has unleashed over the millennia. The only mercy you could ever hope for from him is a swift end. He is a destroyer, and anyone foolish enough to get in his way doesn't tend to live long enough to realize what a stupid mistake it was to challenge him, said Atlas, looking around the gathered forces. He observed the demigods, who looked even more nervous upon learning what Thor is really like. Until the titan looked directly at Alabaster, who no longer looked confident at the idea of going against the son of Thor, if he's even half the destroyer his father is. Yet you believe his son does not pose a problem? Then by all means, return to that camp to deal with him yourself. Perhaps there may be enough of you left to bury once he's finished, Atlas said, making Alabaster lower his head under the general's cold and evil eyes. Personally, Atlas wasn't too concerned about the whiskered redhead, confident in his own unrivaled strength and power as a titan to deal with him. But it had been intriguing to learn how strong he already was, enough to defeat the daughter of Zeus, who was already a powerful demigod. But if the Olympians desire to get help from outsiders, then perhaps we will get our own allies, Atlas thought with a wicked smirk, knowing there were plenty of others who either hated the Olympians or would enjoy seeing them brought down from their mountain. Even better, they could use this to weaken Zeus with how his daughter, an only living demigod in the modern era, had been defeated by a foreign one. Yes, this will certainly be useful, thought Atlas, knowing that the Titans will soon retake their places as rulers of the cosmos. With Naruto, after his fight with Talia, along with offering to train her, Bianca, Nico, and Annabeth, Naruto and the D'Angelo siblings went to the Hades cabin to get settled inside, finding that the inside of the cabin looked much bigger on the inside. The first room they saw upon entering looked to be a lounge area with a gray carpet, black leather sofas and chairs around an ebony wood coffee table, bookshelves, and even a TV, while a long hallway led to the rooms, each of them having a single black four-poster bed, a desk, and their own bathrooms, with there also being empty shelves and bookcases for them to use however they wanted. So, what do you two think? Naruto asked once they'd all chosen their rooms and gotten settled in them before they returned to the lounge area. This is awesome, said Nico, sitting in one of the chairs, liking how their cabin looked so far and that they had their own rooms. It's definitely not what I expected, said Bianca, not thinking the cabin would look like this, but wasn't complaining, especially at not having to worry about sharing a bathroom. That's good. Though have you decided which of you is going to be the cabin counselor? Questioned Naruto, figuring each cabin had a counselor, but wasn't sure how it was decided. If it was the oldest demigod, if they were chosen by their parents or cabin mates, or inheriting a certain ability. This made Bianca and Nico share a look for a few moments before turning back to the Uzumaki. Well, what if we wanted you to be our cabin counselor, said Bianca, much to Naruto's surprise. Me, Naruto said, not expecting them to want him to be counselor if that's even allowed, given how he's not only a foreign demigod but not even a camper. Yeah, you know more than either of us about all this, and are a lot stronger, Nico said with Bianca nodding in agreement and smiling at the whiskered redhead. You would be a much better choice than either of us since we're still learning about being demigods. Being a counselor seems like it'd only distract us from everything else we'd have to learn, added Bianca, making Naruto look between them with an unsure expression. And you're both sure about this? said Naruto, with the siblings nodding in response making him sigh. Okay, I'll be the cabin counselor, but only temporarily. Once the two of you have gotten caught up on everything and gotten some training done, it'll be your responsibility. Naruto said, willing to be their counselor until one of them is prepared to take over, since it's still their cabin. That sounds fair, Bianca replied, with her brother nodding in response. Good. Now, how are you both feeling, really? With all of this and then learning who your dad is, Naruto said, sitting down, while Bianca and Nico frowned at the question. I feel like I'm still processing everything. It all just seems to be going so fast. One second we're at a dance, then we're being attacked by a manticore, almost kidnapped and are killed. Learn that gods and goddesses are real. A lot of gods apparently. We meet a goddess and her followers than her twin brother. And now we're at some medieval-style summer camp that teaches us how to fight monsters. Then we learn our dad is Hades, the actual Hades and king of the underworld, said Bianca, feeling physically and mentally tired from everything that's happened in such a short amount of time. Yeah, it's certainly a lot to take in all at once. Even just learning about a single pantheon is hard to believe. But learning the existence of all the others can be pretty crazy. It'll get easier though. Just take it one step at a time. And don't forget that I'm here if you need anything or have any questions, Naruto said, smiling at the brunette which she returned. What was it like? 
When you learned who your dad is, how strong and important he is, said Nico looking at his Hades figurine before looking at Naruto, wondering what he felt after learning Thor was his father. Nico, Bianca said while frowning at her brother, doubting that Naruto wanted to talk about his father, only for Naruto to raise a hand. It's fine and understandable. If your dad was someone like Apollo or Hermes, it wouldn't be an issue since they have plenty of kids. But learning he's one of the big three, the eldest of them, and that he's a king, it kind of puts you on a pedestal, as though you now have something you need to live up to, said Naruto, causing Bianca to frown, unable to help but nod. While she's still processing everything, it did make her nervous to learn their father is Hades. Remembering what Andromeda said of how everyone started looking to Talia for answers when she showed up, just because her father is Zeus, and then everything Andromeda went through since learning the truth, due to her own father being Poseidon. Now they learn their father is Hades, who doesn't have the best reputation given his position and the domain he rules over. Is that what it was like when you learned who your father is? When he brought you to Asgard. Everyone put you on a pedestal and expected you to live up to his reputation, Bianca asked, with the Uzumaki shrugging in response. The truth is, I always knew who my father was. My mom told me when I was old enough. So, it wasn't the biggest shock when he finally showed up. To me, it was just the chance to meet him in person. But, then he took me to Asgard, and that's when the pressure came. The expectations that came with being the son of Thor, Naruto replied while looking up at the ceiling. I wasn't born a god like my siblings, that alone set me apart from them. And what led to my training, I wasn't only expected to live up to his reputation, but be even better since I was only a demigod. The ironic part is before my training began, I was excited about it. I wanted to prove I could be just as good if not better than my siblings. To show everyone I was worthy of being my father's son. And look how that turned out, said Naruto, smiling bitterly, with the siblings frowning before he shook his head and looked at them. Anyway, when it comes to trying to live up to the reputation of your parents, don't worry about it, and don't let anyone try pushing you to be better just to satisfy them. Be as good as you want to be, train the way you feel suits you the best, and never let anyone make you be something you're not. Be who you want to be, Naruto said while giving Nico a look at the end, making the younger D'Angelo squirm slightly. Though I'm sure neither of you will have to worry about Hades placing any unreasonable expectations on you, since he's known to be one of the more fair and understanding gods. And while he doesn't show it, he cares about his children and accepts them no matter what. The only thing he'd want is what's best for both of you, added Naruto, causing Nico to relax while Bianca put a hand on his shoulder, smiling reassuringly at her brother. He did make this cabin just for us and claimed us the moment we arrived at camp. So that seems to show he cares, Bianca said, knowing what her brother is worried about. Nico smiled slightly at them, before he soon perked up with an eager expression. Do you think dad would let us summon Cerberus? Nico asked, excited at the idea of being able to summon their father's guard dog, only to yelp when Bianca smacked him on the head while looking at him blankly. You're not going to talk about a monster that's likely the size of a building, like it's a puppy you can take for a walk, said Bianca not even wanting to imagine what Nico would do if their father did let him take Cerberus out of the underworld. She's right, Nico. Start off small with regular hellhounds. Those usually only grow to the size of a grizzly bear and are much more manageable, Naruto said with a smirk, making Nico grin. Don't encourage him, Bianca said, giving the Uzumaki a warning look. What? I'm just helping him learn responsibility. A pet seems like a good start, said Naruto, his smirk only growing. Yeah, I can handle a pet, Nico added wanting to have his own hellhound. Then get a normal pet, not something from the underworld, said Bianca, only to blush when Naruto grabbed her and pulled her to sit next to him while wrapping an arm around her. Relax, Bianca. Nothing bad would happen. You know I wouldn't let anything happen to you, Naruto said while looking at her, making her blush intensify at seeing how close they were. Yeah, Bianca replied, with the whiskered redhead smiling at her. Then you'll know I would never do anything that'd endanger you. Or Nico, I guess, said Naruto smirking at the son of Hades. Hey, Nico said in annoyance. So, trust me when I say that nothing will happen to either of you when I'm around. That includes if any of the campers start giving you trouble, just because of your father is. Okay, Naruto said. Okay, said Bianca, nodding in response, while a smile slowly appeared on her face. If you two are going to start kissing, I'm leaving, stated Nico, before quickly ducking and running to his room, laughing, when Bianca threw her shoe at him. I swear. I'll send you to meet our dad myself, Bianca said while blushing brightly with Naruto, chuckling lightly. You're feisty when you're angry, Naruto said in amusement as he stood up, only to be surprised when Bianca pulled him back down and laid her head on his shoulder. Uh, be a dash, said Naruto, not expecting her to do that. Ah, uh, ah, uh, you started it when you pulled me down, now you get to be my pillow until I say so, said Bianca, blushing at her own action, even more so when Naruto wrapped an arm around her. I can live with that, Naruto said, smiling at the brunette which she returned, 
enjoying the moment of peace after such a chaotic day. Later, with the hunters. Meanwhile, after night had fallen over the camp, Artemis brought her hunters to the archery range to start their training and help get Andromeda started on her own. Given that her hunters were at their strongest during the night, it made it the perfect time to start their training. How do you feel? Asked Artemis as she looked at Andromeda, who'd been surprised when they went outside and felt so much better in the moonlight, but now was smiling and waving her hand around with a ball of water in the air, one that she had actually managed to pull out of the air. Stronger, a lot stronger. Like I just jumped into the ocean and could fight Ares again for an entire day. I even feel like I could lift up the entire canoe lake if I wanted, said Andromeda before focusing, causing the water ball to dissolve back into the air, making Artemis smile and nod. That's understandable. Becoming one of my hunters doesn't just grant you my blessing, but you'll find your power over water is even greater at night. Given the symbiotic relationship between the ocean and the moon, as one thing mortals got right is that the moon's presence helps affect the tides, making them stronger on the side of the planet the moon is facing. It's why outside of my father and brother, your father is one of the few males I'm on good terms with, Artemis explained, much to Andromeda's surprise before she smiled in amusement. That sounds like something from Avatar, said Andromeda, with the moon goddess nodding in response. A few times mortals can make a decent show with such accurate details. Now let's see your archery, Artemis said, motioning Andromeda to stand with the other hunters who were practicing with their bows or hunting knives. Nodding in response, Andromeda stood in front of a target before grabbing her bow and knocking an arrow. Yet the ravenette felt nervous. Given all her other attempts at using a bow, usually ended with her shooting everything and everyone but the target. I really hope that blessing extended to being able to use a bow, Andromeda thought, releasing a breath and shooting the arrow, smiling happily when it actually hit the target. Though it wasn't anywhere near the center, Andromeda was happy at finally hitting the target for once. Looking back at Artemis, the moon goddess smiled and nodded at her, making her smile grow before she began more shooting arrows, feeling more confident with each one. The next day after Naruto's fight against Talia, the Uzumaki sat with Bianca and Nico at the dining pavilion for breakfast with there now being another table present for the Hades cabin. Once they'd finished, the three met up with Talia and Annabeth before Naruto led them into the forest to begin their training. Naruto, are you sure it's a good idea to be in here? There are supposed to be monsters, said Bianca, feeling a little nervous at entering the forest after learning it was stocked with monsters. That makes it the best place for training. As now you'll also need to be prepared for any sudden attacks and learn to react without warning. And it's better you get that experience in a semi-safe location than out in the world, where you'd be more likely to be killed, Naruto replied, believing it'll be good training along with what he'll be teaching them. What'll you be teaching us? Nico asked eagerly, wanting to know what they'll be learning under the whiskered redhead. Mostly the basics, hand-to-hand -hand combat, using weapons, using your abilities, and survival training. Once you've got a good grasp on all that, then we'll be moving on to more advanced stuff. You'll also be free to train on your own, said Naruto before they soon reached a good spot, with him then looking at the demigods. All right, we'll be training here every day after breakfast, only stopping when you two need to have your other lessons with Annabeth. Then after those, we'll be back here again, understood, Naruto said, looking at the four, with them all nodding in agreement. Good. Now, before we begin, Annabeth, what can you do? Questioned Naruto, turning to the daughter of Athena, causing Annabeth to blink at the sudden question. What can I do? Annabeth asked. Yes, as in any abilities you inherited from your mother, the training you have so far, everything you're capable of. I already know what Talia can do from our fight, but I want to know what you can do, Naruto said, wanting to know their current skill sets and abilities so he knows what he's working with. I'm a pretty good fighter, both with weapons and in hand-to-hand. -hand. I'm also stronger, agile, and more durable than regular mortals since my mom is a war goddess. I know how to communicate with Morse code, and I have some knowledge and skill in first aid. The abilities I inherited from my mom are an affinity for the arts and music, but not to the same extent as children of Apollo, control over weapons and I'm proficient with a knife, a bow, and swords along with being able to disarm almost any one of their weapons. And obviously I'm really intelligent which helps me strategize and outsmart opponents with my planning, whether it's before or during battle. I also know everything there is to know about craftsmanship, especially architecture, Annabeth explained proudly, only to flinch when Naruto flicked her on the forehead. Watch your pride, that'll get you killed faster than anything, warned Naruto making the blonde demigod frown and rub her forehead. Yeah, I know, said Annabeth, aware that her fatal flaw is her hubris, but she can't help it sometimes. Well, at least you acknowledge your own weaknesses, just make sure you keep it under control, Naruto said, with Annabeth nodding in response. But there's no denying that even if you don't have any flashy abilities, you do have the potential to become a very skilled and dangerous fighter. Even more so than the demigods with abilities, said Naruto, much to their surprise, with Annabeth unable to help but smirk at this. Uh, no offense to Annie or anything, but how can she do that? Talia asked, fully aware Annabeth was talented and strong in her own right.
but the Ravenette had trouble seeing her becoming that strong. Because she has very unique abilities that alone won't do her much good. But combine them together, and you have someone who can take down anyone if they put their mind to it. You all have ADHD, right? Naruto asked, confusing the four demigods. Ah uh, yeah? We have ADHD. It's our battle reflexes to help us stay alive in fights, replied Annabeth, confused at the random question. It also explains a lot, Bianca muttered, looking at her brother dryly. Having learned from the orientation film that demigods have ADHD and dyslexia, this helped explain why Nico could hardly sit still for more than five minutes and always kept finding new hobbies or interests. That's right, it helps you predict and see where an opponent will strike by how they tense their muscles. Now combine that with audiokinesis to be able to hear things like they're breathing, where they're stepping, even just the slightest sound they're making, which would also be very good if you can't see them. Add in being able to strategize and create plans in the middle of combat, as well as being able to analyze their fighting style. You could be ready to react and counter their next move before they even do it, Naruto explained before looking at Annabeth. That is what makes you dangerous. Maybe you won't ever have the raw power that some demigods have, but the most dangerous weapon you have is right here, said Naruto, tapping the side of her head. As long as you use it the right way, and make sure to not let your pride get in the way, then you won't need raw power, Naruto said, with the daughter of Athena smiling at this. You really know how to make someone motivated, stated Annabeth liking the idea of being able to show how brains can triumph over brawn. Hey Whiskers, when you asked us if we had ADHD, you sounded like you don't have it. Aren't you dyslexic and ADHD too? Talia asked, frowning at the Uzumaki, which also got the other demigods' interest. No, I'm not. My brain isn't hardwired to any language. I can read and understand English and all the ones I've learned just fine. And my battle reflexes are ones I've trained and honed through combat, replied Naruto. Much to Annabeth's intrigue and Talia's annoyance that he didn't have to worry about either dyslexia or ADHD. What about where Norse demigods go to train? Do you have a camp, or are they all taken to Asgard to be trained? Annabeth asked, with Naruto shrugging in response. I don't know. I've never met another Norse demigod before. If there are any others, then they're probably left on their own. And no, I doubt there'd be a camp to train at, replied Naruto. Not sure what any of the other Asser or Vanir did with any demigods they had. All right, any other questions before we begin? Naruto said, looking at them to see if they wanted to ask anything else. What kind of powers would we have inherited from our dad? Bianca asked, with Nico also being curious about this. The powers you'd get from Hades. The most noticeable ones would be Umberkinesis to control and manipulate darkness and shadows, as well as Necromancy to summon, control, and destroy the dead with Osteokinesis being part of that to control and summon bones. But there's also Geokinesis since being the god of the underworld. He has control over the earth. Pharaohkinesis, which can be used to summon precious metals and jewels from underground and control them. Some other abilities you could have inherited are pyrokinesis to use hellfire, hypnokinesis to manipulate dreams and put people to sleep, and phobikinesis to manipulate and radiate fear, Naruto explained, much to their surprise and amazement, before Nico grinned in excitement. That's awesome, said Nico, excited and eager to learn which of those powers he had and what he'll be able to do with them. That is really a lot, Bianca said. Having expected the necromancy and umberkinesis given their father's position, but all those other powers surprised her. With the brunette unable to deny feeling a little excited to see what she can do as well. Yeah, some demigods can inherit more abilities than others, depending on the domains their godly parent has control of. But it just means that much more training to learn and master them. And even then there's always room for improvement and learning new ways to use your powers, replied Naruto. Like you? You learn how to do all kinds of things with electricity and lightning. But what else can you do? Questioned Talia wanting to know what else Naruto is capable of, eager to do everything he can. In response, Naruto held his hands behind his back before walking towards a tree, confusing the demigods for a moment, until they were shocked when he placed his foot on the tree and began walking up it as if it was solid ground. What the Tartarus? Annabeth muttered in disbelief as they kept looking higher and higher at Naruto until he walked out onto a branch, leaving him upside down. Electrostatic adhesion, by channeling electricity to any part of your body you can stick to anything it touches, like being able to walk up a vertical surface, Naruto said, making the demigods look at his feet, being able to see sparks of electricity coming off of the bottom of them, before Naruto cut off the flow of electricity, making him fall to the ground, only for the demigods to be further shocked as a sphere of electricity formed around him, keeping him floating in midair, with the whiskered redhead rotating until he was right side up again. You can also manipulate electromagnetic fields to be able to fly and create a shield around yourself to deflect projectiles, said Naruto causing Nico to grab a rock and throw it at him, only for it to bounce off the shield. Don't just throw rocks at someone, Nico, Bianca said, smacking him on the head. Ah, call me. On Bianca, he said it'd deflect it, and I wanted to see what would happen, said Nico, rubbing his head. 
while Naruto floated back to the ground. Just be glad I only used enough power to deflect objects, only. Creating a stronger shield would make anything that hits it be sent flying back at whoever threw it faster than a bullet, warned Naruto, making the demigods pale slightly, especially Nico at what could have happened. What else can you do? Annabeth asked, nervous that he could do something like that without even attacking. I can also do this, Naruto said, holding his hand out and gathering electricity in it, until soon he was holding a small ball of electricity. Naruto then threw the ball of electricity up into the air. The demigods once again were shocked when the ball exploded in a burst of electricity. I call it my chakra knot. It's done by collecting a good amount of electricity using a magnetic field before throwing it, with it exploding like you just saw. If it hits someone or something, it can stick to them. It can be weak enough to temporarily paralyze a person or a group of people standing together, or strong enough to fry them. I can also make it so that once it explodes, it disperses into multiple other ones to hit a larger area, said Naruto before holding out his hands as lightning sparked between them. Another ability is being able to chain lightning between enemies. By hitting one, I can manipulate the lightning to jump towards any enemy, repeating it until they're all connected. That way, I can take them down all at once, Naruto explained, with him then clenching his fists and pulling his arms apart, causing the lightning to suddenly solidify around his fists and elongate into blades. Whoa, Bianca said in shock, looking at the blades of pure lightning that were now wrapped around Naruto's arms and hands. And there's this, my gigawatt blades for some extra damage with hand-to-hand -hand combat, said Naruto while smirking at their expressions before he dispersed the electric blades. I never stood a chance against you, did I? Talia stated, willing to admit that she really had no chance of beating Naruto at all, no matter how much it hurt her pride. No, not really. But don't take it personally that I didn't really go all out against you. Like I said, it was just a spar, and I didn't want to seriously hurt you. Even if you do like it rough, said Naruto, smirking in amusement at the ravenette. If you can teach me to do all of that and whatever else you can do, then be as rough as you want with me. Talia said eagerly, wanting to do everything she just saw, except the flying part. While she'll happily learn to create a shield of lightning around herself to deflect projectiles, she'll stick with keeping her feet firmly on the ground. You can be rough with me too. Don't hold anything back. Bianca said while looking at Talia in annoyance, along with blushing at what she just said. Don't worry, I wasn't planning on holding back for any of you. I'm going to make sure that when you're out in the world, monsters will be the ones running. Not you, said Naruto, much to their excitement. Uh, one more question. How exactly do you think of doing things like that with your powers? Annabeth asked, curious about where he'd get ideas to use his powers like this. Video games, movies, comics, anime, manga, Naruto replied, much to their disbelief. Wait, seriously? said Talia, not expecting him to get ideas from things like that. Yes, you'd be surprised by the inspiration you can get from those things, especially in new ways to control an element. A lot of my techniques I got from games, anime, comics, and manga, things like that, Learning new and creative ways lightning and electricity can be used, said Naruto, much to Annabeth's and Talia's disbelief. Does that include ways we could use our powers? Nico asked, liking the idea of learning new ways to use his powers from comics, anime, manga, and video games. Definitely, you and Bianca would get plenty of inspiration for ways to use your powers, even more so with how many you could potentially have, Naruto replied, making the younger boy grin in excitement while Bianca looked interested. And would I be able to learn anything from them? said Annabeth with a raised brow, still skeptical but willing to give it a chance if they'd prove helpful. Probably. While you wouldn't find it useful in learning about any powers, you could focus on the way characters act, plan, and strategize, learning how to think of unexpected and surprising ways to fight, becoming unpredictable for opponents, said Naruto, with the daughter of Athena humming in thought. Now I think that's enough questions, and we still need to get started on training. So let's begin, said Naruto, with the demigods nodding in response as they began training. Later. Naruto had the four demigods start with basic exercises, beginning with some stretching before then running 20 laps around the perimeter of the forest. Then they moved on to 80 push-ups, pull-ups, jumping jacks, and sit-ups. All the while, he'd shoot low-powered bolts of electricity at them, not strong enough to really hurt them but enough to knock them down if they're hit. This forced them to dodge the blasts, or else he'd have them do the exercises all over again. The demigods were relieved when it came time for lunch, as well as Bianca's and Nico's lessons with Annabeth. This allowed them time to rest and recover after having to repeat the exercises again and again, given at least one of them failed to dodge the electric bolts. Thankfully, once their lessons ended and they went back to training, rather than repeat the exercises again, Naruto had them begin working on their powers. He started them off small, with Talia working on sticking to a tree by channeling electricity to the bottom of her feet. The D'Angelo siblings had started working on manipulating shadows and being able to shadow travel through them, telling them to only try traveling short distances within camp. Annabeth had been told to try and land a hit on the whiskered redhead, using whatever means necessary. Ah, 
This is impossible, Talia said as she fell to the ground, glaring at the tree in annoyance, having barely managed to stick one of her feet to it, and only for a few seconds. You've already seen me do it, so yes, it is possible, said Naruto, looking down at Talia, making the ravenette glare at him. Yeah, and I thought it'd be easy with how you did it. So why can't I, said Talia, not liking how something that looked easy could be so difficult to do. And I've trained to master it, while you are only just starting out. But your problem is you aren't in control, Naruto said, which only annoyed Talia further as she got up. I'm perfectly in control, Talia retorted, only for them to hear a crack of lightning in the sky, making the Uzumaki look at her with a raised brow. Clearly, stated Naruto, with Talia crossing her arms and huffing in annoyance. I don't even see why I need to learn this first. Wouldn't an attack be better to learn, like that chakranaut? Or better yet, those gigawatt blades? Talia asked, preferring if she learned how to use those rather than sticking to trees. If you can't do something as simple as electrostatic adhesion, then you'll never be able to use those attacks, Naruto said, raising a hand to stop the daughter of Zeus from speaking when she opened her mouth. It's not just about sticking to any surface, it's about control. Until yesterday, you only saw lightning as a weapon to be used, never seeing any reason to hold back with your attacks, giving it your all in a fight, and as we saw with the manticore that usually just means running straight at the enemy, said Naruto, with Talia scowling in annoyance as she gained a faint embarrassed blush. Never gonna drop that, are you? Talia stated, annoyed that he'd brought that up again. I will once you give me a reason to not bring it up. Anyway, you saw how I used lightning and electricity during our fight, and then being able to use it to heal, how I could shape it however I liked. That's because I learned to control the output of it. Like with my chakra nod. If I use too little power it'd either disperse before it can detonate or, at most, all the person hit with it would feel as a weak tingle. But if I use too much or I can't contain it correctly, then it's likely to blow up early, possibly in my face. That's the purpose of learning electrostatic adhesion. Not only is it a useful ability to stick to any surface, but it teaches you to control the amount of electricity you use in it. If you use too much, the electricity will explode the moment it touches the surface. And using too little only lets you stick for a few moments before it ends, Naruto explained. The Ravenette frowned but slowly nodded in understanding. So, I need to give it more juice so I can stick, but not enough to the point I end up shooting lightning out my feet, said Talia, with Naruto nodding in response. That's right. So far you're using a good amount of stick for a short while, just slowly add more energy and make sure you stay focused. If you lose your focus you'll either fall or be blown back. But once you do have the right amount, it'll be easier to eventually learn to do it instinctually, Naruto said, Talia nodding at this. All right, fine. I'll keep trying to climb the stupid tree, said Talia, grunting in annoyance when Naruto flicked her forehead. Don't worry, once you can do that, you'll be able to start learning all the new ways to blast and or blow things up, said Naruto, making Talia smirk eagerly at this. Before their attention turned to Bianca when she suddenly rose from some shadows, with the brunette panting lightly as she leaned against a tree. How far did you go? Naruto asked. I, I go to, um, I ended up on the beach, like, I don't know, maybe a mile away from camp. Then, when I ended up at the big house, and I needed to rest there for a while, before coming back here, replied Bianca, feeling completely drained from shadow traveling. Are you feeling all right? Talia asked while looking at her cousin, not expecting her to be this tired. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Just, didn't think it'd be this exhausting, Bianca said, pushing off the tree once she was sure she could stand on her own. That's to be expected, shadow travel can be an exhausting ability, even monsters like hellhounds can be tired out from it. It's why I wanted you and Nico to only shadow travel short distances around camp. Otherwise if you went too far you'd likely pass out once you arrived at wherever you ended up. But the more you do it, the easier it'll become. Just make sure you don't spend too much time in the shadows, said Naruto, with the daughter of Hades nodding in response. Out of curiosity, what's that like, anyway? Moving through the shadows? asked Talia, making Bianca frown in thought dark, for starters, but at the same time you can see where you're going at the end. It's like going down a really long tunnel. As you still need to travel to where you're going, you don't just go in and suddenly come out. The best comparison would be like taking a train with your head sticking out the window, Bianca replied, with Talia nodding slowly at this. The trio's attention then turned to Nico when he suddenly came running out of a shadow, falling to his hands and knees panting heavily while looking around wildly, only feeling relieved, when he saw where he was and collapsed to the ground. Cool. I got away from the ants, Nico said, rolling onto his back much, to Bianca's concern. What ants? Bianca asked, wondering what happened to her brother. These giant ants, huge, crazy things, in a giant anthill. I ended up in another part of the forest, and there they were, moving around. I tried shadow traveling, but I was too tired, so I had to run. I was nearly grabbed by them, but I managed to jump into the shadows in time and got back here, replied Nico, much to Bianca's and Talia's shock. 
There's a mermeek's lair in the forest? Talia exclaimed, not expecting a mermeek's lair to be here. What's a mermeek? questioned Bianca, only able to guess they must some kind of monster that looked like giant ants. Monsters that resemble ants, only being the size of a full-grown German shepherd, along with having a love of shiny things, like gold. They make their lairs in giant anthills that are filled with their collections of stolen shiny stuff. They can spray acid, have pretty tough back armor, mandibles that can rip your limbs off if they catch you, and they can call the rest of the hive to aid them if they're threatened, making them mostly dangerous by being able to swarm you if you aren't careful, Naruto explained, making Bianca pale and shiver at those monsters actually being here in the forest. Good job, Nico. You managed to find some good practice targets, said Naruto, smiling at the son of Hades, while Talia and Bianca looked at him in disbelief. You can't be serious? Talia said, knowing how easily mermeeks can swarm and take down even the most skilled fighters. While she and Annabeth might have a chance, that's only if they can ensure they don't get swarmed and surrounded. Bianca and Nico wouldn't stand a chance. Oh, I'm very serious, but I'm not crazy. You won't be fighting the mermeeks, not yet anyway. But once you all are trained up, you will be. It seems like the perfect test to see how far you've come and what improvements are needed to your training, Naruto replied, believing that clearing out the mermeek's lair would be good to see their progress. Are you sure about that? Couldn't we have something easier to go against? Bianca asked, not wanting to go against a swarm of giant ants when they've only just started their training. You can't simply hope to always fight something easy. There will be times you encounter monsters much stronger than mermeeks. At least this time, you'll know what you're going against and what they can do, so you know what to expect and prepare accordingly and by the time you do go after them, you'll also have your own weapons. I'll also be there and step in, but only if I see any of you are in danger of dying, as it'll still be up to you four to kill them. Besides, once you've killed them all, anything they have in their horde will be free for you to take, said Naruto, making Talia and Bianca frown but reluctantly nod in understanding. Fine, but if I end up being turned into a tree again or actually dying this time, I will haunt your ass whiskers, Talia warned, with the Uzumaki smirking at her before he looked down at Nico to see he'd fallen asleep from exhaustion. Well, I suppose we can stop training for the day. But first, said Naruto as he punched the tree beside him, with the three awake demigods hearing a scream as Annabeth fell out, with Naruto catching her before she hit the ground. Were you planning on staying up there all day? Naruto asked rhetorically, while the daughter of Athena blushed lightly upon seeing she was being carried in his arms, before she scowled at him. I was working out a plan to hit you, Annabeth retorted having already failed several previous attempts at hitting him. She had tried attacking from behind, the sides, even charging at him from the front when he least expected it. But each of her attempts failed as he'd block her attacks and then toss her aside, forcing her to try again, leading to Annabeth hiding in the bushes or behind trees, waiting until his guard was dropped to strike, only to once again fail. Even when she tried distracting him, she still couldn't land a single hit on the whiskered redhead. Before the daughter of Athena decided to try striking from above, having gone and climbed up a tree, moving into a position where she could tackle him from above, only to grow worried that her attempt would fail again, leading to her trying to think of a plan to succeed. But each plan she thought of was discarded, doubting any would work. Annabeth was a little embarrassed that she'd been so deep in thought trying to make a plan. She forgot she was even in the tree until it started shaking and she fell out, her annoyance only growing at realizing Naruto was the one who made her fall. And that's your problem. You got worried none of your plans would work after all your other failed attempts, and began overthinking it, losing focus on what you were supposed to be doing and instead trying to make a plan, said Naruto while setting Annabeth down, with Talia and Bianca looking at her in annoyance with how she was carried by the Uzumaki. Well, how am I supposed to get a hit on you when everything I've tried hasn't worked? Annabeth retorted, knowing it'd be impossible for her to actually hit Naruto. Then try something you wouldn't normally do, be unexpected and shocking. All of your attempts have been expected and predictable, which won't always work. A surprise attack won't work if an enemy is already expecting it. So, don't go for the surprise attack, go for something that will shock them so you can get in close and attack before they can react, Naruto replied, making the blonde demigod frown thoughtfully. Naruto then grabbed Nico and lifted him over his shoulder before looking at the three female demigods. Training's done for today, rest up and meet back here tomorrow, and be prepared since we won't always be doing the same training every day, said Naruto, with the three nodding before they left the forest. Time skip, one day. The next day, Talia, Annabeth, Bianca, and Nico returned to the forest with Naruto already there, waiting for them. The demigods immediately noticed several targets set up, either being attached to trees, hanging from them by ropes, and some even hidden behind bushes and boulders. I'm guessing we'll be working on target practice today, Annabeth stated, before quickly catching two pouches Naruto tossed at her. You'll be working on target practice today, since you're the only one without a means of long-range attacks. While Bianca and Nico will be learning to use swords, 
said Naruto, tossing two training swords at the siblings. Sweet, Nico said, smiling excitedly at learning to use a sword, while Bianca looked unsurely at the weapon. Are you sure? Aren't there any other weapons we could try? Like something easier and less dangerous? Bianca asked, preferring if they started with something smaller, like a dagger or even a bow. Once you get a good grasp of using a sword, then we'll move on to other weapons before settling on whichever one you feel most comfortable with, Naruto replied, making the brunette sigh before nodding in response. Does that mean I'll still be working on walking up a tree? said Talia, only for the Uzumaki to smirk at her. No, you're gonna be sparring with me in hand-to-hand -hand combat, Naruto said, making the daughter of Zeus smirk as well. Now we're speaking my language, Talia stated, eager to see how he fights without any weapon or powers. Though when Naruto's smirk widened and he began chuckling darkly, Talia wasn't sure if she should be nervous or excited. Say that again once we get started. And just some friendly advice, my father is also the god of wrestling, said Naruto, causing the ravenette to gulp a little. Why am I using these? Annabeth asked, making the others turn to her, only to see her holding the pouches in one hand, while in her other, she was holding a kanai and shuriken. Shouldn't I try using a bow? said Annabeth, not expecting him to have her use kanai and shuriken. No, as that'd be expected. While these would be a surprise, since it's unlikely anyone would expect a demigod to use kanai and shuriken. Plus, they're a lot more useful than a bow and arrows, replied Naruto, while the other demigods looked at Annabeth's weapons curiously. How? Annabeth said, not seeing how they were better than a bow. For starters, you save time drawing an arrow and aiming it, while with these you just grab them and throw. You can also use the kunai as close-range weapons. And with shuriken, they can do this, Naruto said, grabbing some shuriken out of the pouch. The demigods then watched as Naruto threw each of the shuriken through the air, surprised when they all curved and stabbed right through one target for each shuriken. Even more amazing was that he didn't even look at where they were. With a bow, you need a direct line of sight to a target to hit them. With a shuriken, you just need to know where they are and get the right angle to hit them, which I'm sure you'll be able to figure out how to get the right angle and trajectory, said Naruto, with Annabeth looking at the weapons in renewed interest before her eyes widened in surprise when she saw the shuriken pouch was refilled. Are these magic? questioned Annabeth looking at the targets he hit, only to see the shuriken disappeared from them. Enchanted. Anytime you throw them they'll return to the pouches instantly. They'll also never lose their edge, so no worries of needing to keep them sharp. And yes, they do work on monsters, Naruto replied, much to the blonde's amazement before she smiled gratefully. Thank you, these will really come in handy, said Annabeth before strapping the kanai pouch to her right thigh and the shuriken pouch to the back of her pants. Can we get started now? Bianca asked while giving Annabeth an annoyed side glare at being given something like that. Yes, Annabeth, stand here and don't move. You're going to try and hit as many bullseyes as you can without moving from this spot, said Naruto, motioning to where the daughter of Athena would stand. Moving to the spot, Annabeth frowned as she looked around at all the targets, only to see she couldn't see where all of them were. Knowing that she'll need to curve the shuriken through the air if she wanted to hit them, Annabeth began going through all the target locations and how she'll need to hit them. Now, let's get started on you too, Naruto said turning to Bianca and Nico before grabbing his own training sword to show them how to use it. Later, after showing Bianca and Nico the basics of wielding a sword, as well as some beginner moves, Naruto had them spar against each other, knowing it'll help them start building experience in fighting with a sword. Along with how they'll know everything the other did, they need to improvise and change how they fight to gain an advantage. Naruto then went to spar against Talia in hand-to-hand -hand combat, with them being allowed to use any means of attacking to win, as long as they didn't use weapons or powers. With the Ravenette soon learning the whiskered redhead was just as skilled with his fists as he was with a weapon. Again, said Talia, grunting as she stood up after getting knocked to the ground again. You sure you don't want to take a dash, Naruto said before raising his hand and grabbed Talia's fist when she charged him and threw a punch. Not stopping there, Talia thrust her other fist at Naruto, only for it to be grabbed as well before she could punch him, only for the daughter of Zeus to then lift her knee up, slamming it into his abdomen, making the Uzumaki grunt. With this giving Talia the chance to rear her head back and immediately headbutt Naruto, knocking them both away from each other. Ah, gods damn it. Why would anyone do that? Talia said while holding her head in pain, not expecting it to hurt that much, feeling like she just headbutt a brick wall. Though this cost Talia, with the Uzumaki recovering faster and immediately rushed her, slamming his elbow into her head, further dazing the ravenette. Before Naruto then grabbed Talia by her shoulders, before spinning around and throwing her towards a tree with Talia gritting her teeth when she slammed into the tree and fell to the ground, before forcing herself back to her feet. Doing so just in time to raise her arms to block Naruto's punch, gritting her teeth again at the impact, with her then quickly grabbing his arm. The ravenette moving quickly as she moved behind the Uzumaki, twisting his arm. As she do so, before she grabbed his other arm and twisted it as well, 
followed by slamming her feet into the back of his knees, knocking him to the ground. Ah, I finally got Dash, Talia said with a pleased smirk at bringing him down to his knees, only for her to be cut off when Naruto managed to twist his hands around and grab her arms as well, before kicking one of his legs and knocking her feet out from under her. With Talia having no time to react as she was flipped through the air and slamming into the ground, knocking the wind out of her. The female demigod then finding herself pinned when Naruto rolled on top of her, pinning her arms and legs. Next time you have an enemy on their knees and their arms pulled behind them, don't gloat. Keep pushing the advantage and either break their arms or kick them hard enough to fracture their spine. Either way, they'll be crippled and helpless. If an enemy can still fight, then the fight isn't over, Naruto said, making Talia grunt in annoyance while trying to break free, only for his grip to remain firm. Noted, can you get off of me now? Talia asked, with Naruto smirking at her. I don't know, I rather like seeing you underneath me, said Naruto. The daughter of Zeus smirked slyly up at him. Oh, do you imagine being on top of me a lot? said Talia with a flirtatious tone. Do you imagine getting me on my knees? You certainly seemed excited when you did, Naruto replied, his smirk turning into a teasing one. What can I say? I like the idea of having you at my mercy, Talia said, only to gulp when Naruto's smirk grew. Maybe I'd be at your mercy, Talia, but rest assured. You'd be the one begging, said Naruto, with the ravenette's eyes widening while a faint blush appeared on her cheeks. That's hot, thought Talia, shamelessly. Are you two done? Bianca asked with an annoyed expression, really not liking the position Naruto and Talia were in or how they were talking. Oh, Bianca, said Nico nervously, seeing how the shadows were beginning to lash out around them. Not now, Nico, said Bianca, turning to her brother, her eyes turning a sulfuric golden yellow with black scara making the son of Hades instantly back away, ready to shadow travel to escape if he needed to. While Naruto chuckled in amusement at Bianca's behavior before getting off of Talia, much to the Ravenette's hidden disappointment. Don't worry, Bianca. We'll be doing hand-to-hand -hand combat training too, eventually. Maybe you'll get me on my knees, or I'll get you on yours, said Naruto, making Bianca blush brightly. Or someone will be on their back, Bianca muttered, which only made her blush intensify. The same goes for Annie, if you're fine with it getting rough. Naruto said to the daughter of Athena, making Annabeth stumble slightly and miss her throw. What? Annabeth said, looking at him with wide eyes and a faint blush, having been completely focused on her throws to notice anything else. Well, I don't want you to feel left out. Talia already got me on my knees, but I put her on her back soon after. And Bianca was getting jealous of being left out, but I made sure she knows she'll get her turn soon. But I'll make sure you get your turn as well, unless you'd want to try together with Talia or Bianca, said Naruto, with Annabeth's blush getting brighter with each word. What? said Annabeth, not believing what she's hearing, while glancing at Bianca and Talia, both of whom were also blushing, though Talia also had a smirk on her face. Sparring, Annie, sparring. I want to make sure you and Bianca know I'll be sparring with both of you in hand-to-hand -hand combat as well, not just with Talia, Naruto clarified with a smirk, while Annabeth's eyes widened before she glared at him. You, Annabeth said, feeling sorely tempted to throw a kanai at him. What else did you think I was talking about? Could little Annie not be so innocent, after all? Naruto asked teasingly, making the daughter of Athena growl. You knew exactly what you were doing, said Annabeth, making the Uzumaki chuckle. What can I say? You three look cute being all flustered like that, Naruto said, which made the girls blush again. Dad, if you can hear me, help. Nico thought, mentally praying to his father to get him out of this situation. But in all seriousness, all of you will be sparring with me, against each other, and together, both with weapons, powers, or hand-to-hand. -hand. That way you'll also work on being able to coordinate with each other to take down your opponent, said Naruto, looking at them, with the four demigods nodding in response while Talia smirked. You sure you could handle all three of us together, Whiskers? We might be too much for you to handle, Talia said, making Annabeth and Bianca blush at the double meaning behind her words. Then you three will need to try really hard if you want to beat me. Because unless I can't get back up, then you won't win, replied Naruto. Then get on your back and stay there, someone said with Naruto suddenly feeling the urge to fall down to his back before shaking his head and looked around. You'll need to do better than that, Naruto said while looking for who did that, before the demigods heard giggling and saw Silena leaning against a tree. Can't blame a girl for trying to get you on the ground, Foxy, said Silena, surprised and impressed he was able to resist her charm speak. If you want me on the ground that much, you'll need to do a lot more than ask nicely, Naruto said, smirking at Silena, making her smile suggestively. I'm sure I can think of a few ideas, Silena replied while walking up to them. How long were you standing there? Annabeth asked while feeling some slight annoyance at Silena's appearance, with Bianca and Talia feeling the same. Long enough to see how all of you have been training. I was also here yesterday, curious about the training Naruto would be giving you all. 
and it's certainly impressive, especially that you managed to resist my charm speak. How'd you do that anyway? Silena asked, knowing her charm speak was the strongest of all her mother's demigod children. Even Drew's wasn't as strong as hers. She knew the only way someone could resist charm speak is if they're incredibly strong willed, and even then they'd still feel some effect before shaking it off. Yet it looked like Naruto wasn't affected at all. You shouldn't have expected it to work at all, someone said, making the demigods turn to see who it was, only to see Artemis stepping out from behind a tree. Finally decided to stop hiding, kid number two, said Naruto, frowning at the moon goddess, while the other demigods turned to him. You knew she was there? Bianca asked, with Naruto nodding in response. Yes, along with knowing she was here yesterday. Any particular reason you feel the need to spy on us? Naruto said, with Artemis frowning that he knew she was here. It is my responsibility to watch you, as well as ensuring nothing untoward happens while you're with three young maidens, said Artemis, having made sure to watch Naruto. Both since that's the reason she's here, and she wanted to make sure he didn't try anything with Bianca, Talia, or Annabeth. This made Bianca, Talia, and Annabeth frown that she thought Naruto would actually try something with them, only to look at Naruto when he began chuckling and smiled in amusement at Artemis. I'm sure it must be such a shock to you, kid number two. What with your whole men are evil spiel? But I'm helping them train because they're my friends and I want to make sure they can take care of themselves, Naruto said, making the demigod smile while Annabeth and Talia were happy, though slightly annoyed, to hear he considered them as friends. Yet you come out into the forest to train rather than remaining in the camp itself. Despite knowing the dangers of what's in here, it instead makes you look rather reckless and uncaring if something happens to them, Artemis retorted, with Naruto's smile never wavering. And yet nothing has happened and nothing will happen. Given that Talia and Annabeth are more than capable of dealing with any monsters in the forest, while Bianca and Nico can at least shadow travel away back to camp. Perhaps if you thought more about that, rather than jumping to conclusions, you'd actually see none of them are in any danger. But then again, you are a kid. So I guess you're used to only seeing what's right in front of you, Naruto said, much to Artemis's annoyance. The only thing I see right now is an arrogant, patronizing boy, said Artemis, causing Naruto's smile to turn into a smirk. If by patronizing you mean helping a child understand why she shouldn't jump to conclusions, then yes I'm very patronizing, kid number two. And do you really want to talk to me about arrogance? Aren't you the ones that live on top of a mountain, just so you can physically and metaphorically look down on everyone, replied Naruto, with Artemis narrowing her eyes at him. Though before she could say anything, the son of Thor turned towards Silena, with her and the other demigods having been watching everything silently with wide eyes, wondering how he could talk back against a goddess like Artemis without any fear or concern. But I suppose kid number two is right about one thing. Charm speak won't work that easily on me, since my mind is just as strong as the rest of me. I'm also no stranger to illusions and know how to resist them, said Naruto, much to their curiosity at how he's dealt with illusions before. Charm speak is more like hypnotism than an illusion, said Silena, only for Naruto to shrug. Hypnotism is just another form of illusion. You make someone do what you want against their will or even realizing what's happening. But that's rather basic. You could have it be much more powerful than simply giving a command. You could say something and make a person believe they're nothing but a helpless infant, or that they're at the bottom of the ocean. If you can target a person's mind, then you can make them see, hear, smell, taste, or feel anything. And the only limit is your own imagination, Naruto explained, with the demigods being amazed, especially Silena at the potential ways she could use charm speak before she smiled at Naruto. Is that your own way of offering to train me as well? Silena asked, causing Bianca, Talia, and Annabeth to gain annoyed expressions that she would join their training. Besides charm speak, what else can you do? Naruto asked, wanting to know what other abilities she had. I'm an expert Pegasus rider, and I have some knowledge of magic, along with knowing how to use a dagger. As for the abilities I inherited from my mom, I can alter my appearance, but it's limited to just changing my hair and eye color. I can control and alter clothes, jewelry, and makeup, and I have minor skills in love magic. And all of Aphrodite's children can speak French, since it's the language of love, Silena replied, with Naruto nodding at this. You certainly do have potential. Even just changing your hair and eye color is good to be able to vanish in a crowd, allowing you to either escape pursuers or get the drop on them. Even more so, if you use your charm speak to make them forget what you look like at all. And having control over clothes and jewelry can be very dangerous, said Naruto, only to look at Talia when she laughed lightly. Uh, no offense, Silena, but how is that a dangerous ability? Talia asked, only to fall silent at Naruto's unamused expression. Imagine those necklaces you were suddenly becoming a garrote wire a bracelet wrapping around your arm and preventing you from reaching for a weapon, or your clothes shrinking and becoming too tight to where you can't even move. Just because a power doesn't seem like it'd be useful doesn't mean it's useless, Naruto said, making Talia frown while Silena smiled at hearing her abilities being praised, even if they weren't the most combat-oriented ones. Right? 
muttered Talia before looking at Naruto when he put a hand on her shoulder. This is so you don't underestimate any enemy, regardless of what powers they have. You never know if a seemingly useless power can prove more dangerous than controlling an element, said Naruto, with the daughter of Zeus nodding in response. Now, though, we'll be taking a break, as it's almost time for lunch as well as Bianca's and Nico's lessons. Silena, if you want to join the training, then meet us back here after their lessons are over, Naruto said, making the demigods nod before they left the forest, with Artemis watching the son of Thor with narrowed eyes before leaving as well. Later, thou art progressing well, Andromeda, so he stated watching with a pleased expression at how Andromeda was progressing with using a bow, with the daughter of Poseidon smiling in thanks to the lieutenant. Thanks, Zoe. I really thought it'd take me a lot longer to even get close to hitting a target, but now it just feels completely natural using a bow, said Andromeda, shooting another arrow, which hit just outside of the bull's eye. It's like that for a lot of the hunters, especially the newer ones. Most of them have never even picked up a bow, let alone learn to use one. But the moment they received Lady Artemis's blessing, they were shooting like they've been doing it for years, all in less than a month, Phoebe said, knowing it can be surprising for new hunters to suddenly gain skill over a weapon they've never used before. Indeed, but it's important that you all keep training, as my blessing only gets you so far before you grow stagnant. While you may be skilled now shooting at stationary targets, aiming at moving prey is far more difficult, said Artemis, with several hunters nodding in agreement with their mistress. I understand, Lady Artemis, though it'll be nice to actually have something to hit monsters from a longer distance, rather than waiting for them to reach me, Andromeda said preferring the chance to be able to kill monsters from a distance than always fighting up close. Not that it'd matter if you're too slow, someone said, causing multiple hunters to immediately aim their bows at who spoke, with a few releasing their arrows when they saw it was Naruto leaning against a tree, only for the arrows to bounce off his lightning shield. Like I said, too slow, said Naruto, making Artemis and her hunters scowl at him. What are you doing here? Artemis demanded, not liking that he's watching her hunters train. Well, since you were watching my own training, I figured you wouldn't mind me watching yours, Naruto said, pushing off the tree and approaching the hunters, only for Artemis to stand in front of him. Yes, I do mind. Now leave, said Artemis, refusing to let him continue watching her hunters. All right, I understand if you don't want me around, Naruto said before purposefully walking around the goddess, much to her growing annoyance. Why aren't you leaving? demanded Artemis, having thought he'd leave now. Oh, I said I understand you don't want me around, but I didn't say I'd leave. Because I don't listen to kids, kid number two replied Naruto, annoying and angering Artemis even more, only to stop again when Zoe held one of her knives to his throat. If thou wilt not leave, then pay for your insolence, Zoe said, glaring at the whiskered redhead, while Naruto rolled his eyes. Haven't we already done this before, sweetheart? You already know how it'll end if you try attacking me, Naruto said before grabbing Zoe's wrist faster than she could react and moved her knife out of the way. Do not call me, sweetheart, growled Zoe, reaching for her other hunting knife only for Naruto to grab her other hand before she could. As the princess commands, what would you like to be called, princess? Naruto said tauntingly, angering Zoe even further. Remember what I said, Zoe, just ignore the kitty and it'll go away, Andromeda said, making Naruto let go of Zoe and look at her with a smirk. For someone that tells others to ignore me, you certainly like getting my attention. Jealous, kid? Naruto asked, only for Andromeda to scoff. Of what exactly? Dealing with a walking headache like you. I can ignore you easily. You're the one that keeps showing up. Maybe your ego just can't handle not being the center of attention all the time, Andromeda retorted, mockingly. I think you're confusing me with your mistress or one of the other children on that mountain. It's so hard to tell, really, with how each of them is so easily offended and needs to lash out to feel secure about themselves. Isn't that right, kid number two? said Naruto, glancing at the moon goddess, who growled lowly and glared at him with her eyes glowing silver. Why do you insist on being such a nuisance? and I am not a kid, Artemis said, reaching her limit with constantly being called kid number two. You're the one that chooses to look like a kid, for some reason. Is it because you like being daddy's little girl to always get your way, or just an excuse to act like a spoiled brat? Naruto said, fully turning to Artemis with narrowed eyes, no longer looking amused, while the hunters glared at him for insulting their mistress. While Artemis's eyes were nearly pure silver with how angry she was getting at the son of Thor before her entire body was engulfed in a silver light. The sight making the hunters instantly turn away, believing she'd actually chosen to unleash her divine form to incinerate Naruto. Though when the light faded and nothing happened, the hunters looked only for a few to be shocked at what they saw. As in Artemis's place was now a tall and well-built young woman with moonlight pale skin, round, pale blue slash silver eyes, and long white hair that went down to the middle of her back. With her wearing black leggings, 
A short white dress with black and blue tips at the bottom that stopped at her mid-thigh and showed plenty of cleavage from her shockingly large breasts, a silver necklace, and silver sandals. Is that Artemis? Andromeda asked in shock and disbelief, a sentiment shared by the hunters who had never seen their mistress take this form. Yes, it's been centuries since the last time we've seen my lady change into her adult form, replied Zoe, not even remembering the last time Artemis looked like this. I can see why, muttered Andromeda, unable to deny that like this, she could honestly say Artemis was the most beautiful goddess in the world. It made the daughter of Poseidon wonder if she chose to look like a little girl just to avoid dealing with the jealousy of the other goddesses. Do I look like a kid now? Artemis demanded, now looking down at Naruto with her new height, while hoping he had done something to warrant her attacking or killing him, only for the goddess of the hunt to get angrier and feel begrudging respect. When the Uzumaki didn't even so much as glance down at her body, his eyes never once leaving her face. Look as old as you want. It doesn't change that you're still a child on the inside, kid number two, said Naruto, not phased at Artemis's attempt to stun him. Though he would silently admit she's definitely beautiful, he's met other goddesses that are just as good, or even better looking. And here I was assuming you would have been taught to show proper respect. Clearly, I overestimated the arrogance of your kind, growled Artemis, before being surprised when Naruto began laughing. Proper respect? Why in all of the nine realms would I show respect to you? Naruto said amused that she believed she deserved any respect from him. I am a goddess, one of the Olympians. I've been alive long before you were even a whisper on the winds. You should be lucky I haven't already struck you down the moment I saw you, Asser. Yet, instead, you have continued to antagonize my hunters, insult me, and now dare to laugh in my face? Artemis hissed, feeling angrier than she has in a long time at encountering such an insolent mortal. Only a moment later, Artemis's eyes widened as she found herself frozen in place while Naruto narrowed his eyes at her. With his eyes glowing with electricity, as hints of red energy were now flickering within them as his pupils narrowed into slits. You think any of that makes you entitled to my respect? Naruto said lowly while stepping closer to Artemis, and despite being taller than him, she couldn't help but feel small under his gaze. I only respect one hunter goddess and she earned it through her own merits, not believing she was entitled to anything. Having trained, fought, and killed to earn everything she has, not simply being handed the position, like you were. And she did it all without any group of children following her around, either. She is the only one I recognize as queen of the hunt and give my respect to, Naruto said before he then glared at Artemis. And you really want to know what I think of you, Artemis? Said Naruto, which actually shocked the goddess, to hear him use her name. You are one of the three Olympian goddesses I have the least amount of respect for. The other two are Hera and Aphrodite, neither of whom have anything but my spite. And you want to know why I have so little respect for you, Artemis? Naruto said, with Artemis unable to say anything in response. It's because you are a sexist and a hypocrite. You see all men as less than garbage, that they do nothing but lie and betray everyone. That they only see women as things to use, abuse, and then toss aside once they lose interest. And while I can understand how you're wary of men after being betrayed by one you had feelings for, said Naruto, only for Artemis to cut him off. I did not have feelings for Orion. Artemis hissed lowly, with the son of Thor looking at her with an unconvinced expression. Sure you didn't, that's why Sunspot was afraid you'd break your vow, along with why you made a constellation for him, yet didn't do the same for anyone else. He was just a friend, Naruto said with a humorless smile, making Artemis glare at him. But you were betrayed by a man you had feelings for, and now you think that gives you the right to see every male as being no different from Orion. Even going as far as cursing anyone that so much as stumbles on wherever it is you're camping, even when most of them likely wouldn't be able to see through the mist. But you don't care, as far as you see it, they're just evil males that need to be punished, said Naruto, while Artemis continued to glare at him. And then you're a hypocrite because you call yourself the protector of maidens and youths, that your hunters are your daughters. Yet if they do anything to displease you, they'll be lucky if you just kill them, Naruto said, much to the moon goddess's anger. I would never hurt any of my hunters. Artemis growled. Then what about Callisto? Demanded Naruto, narrowing his eyes at her with Artemis freezing with wide eyes at the mention of her former hunter and best friend. You not only hurt her, you cursed her, abandoned her, and said if she ever returned you'd kill her. After your own father disguised himself as you to seduce her, and when that failed he simply didn't care, leaving her alone, scared, and pregnant. Forced to hide her shame, knowing what would happen if it was discovered, Naruto said. She lied to me for months. I would have let her go peacefully to settle down, but she kept it a secret until she couldn't anymore. Artemis said lowly, with the Uzumaki chuckling humorlessly. You might as well have just killed her then. Maybe if you actually thought about it, you'd realize she didn't have a choice. 
Staying with you was the only protection she had from Hera, after all. You should know more than most what she does to any woman unlucky enough to get your father's attention, whether they're willing or not. If she told you and you left her alone, how long would it have been before Hera found her and either killed her, cursed her, or made her so miserable she'd wish she was dead? The only person she had was you, her best friend and, if what I heard about her having feelings for you is true, the person she loved. You tossed her aside and threatened to kill her if she ever returned, said Naruto, Artemis looking like she'd just been physically struck, along with feeling shock and horror at realizing he was right. She knew how Hera treated all of her father's lovers and illegitimate offspring, having even cursed her own mother to be unable to give birth on solid ground. Yet she didn't even think of what would await Callisto if she had told her the truth from the start. Even if she hadn't willingly been with Zeus, she'd still have been targeted regardless by Hera. Then there's Atlanta, said Naruto, only for Artemis to stop him. I never did anything to Atlanta, Artemis said, with Naruto smiling coldly at her. Yeah, you never did anything to her or for her. She wasn't one of your hunters, at least not officially, but she still worshipped you, followed you, believed in you. Hell, she idolized you. And yet, you did nothing to help her when she was forced into a marriage she didn't want, Naruto said, but was stopped again. It was her choice to give her hand to whoever beat her in a race. I'm not held responsible for her mistake in choosing to wed, retorted Artemis. Yeah, a race she only lost because the coward that she was forced to marry cheated, throwing those stupid apples in front of her and forcing her to pick them up. And where did he get those apples? Who helped force Atlanta into a marriage she never wanted and led to her getting cursed? That worthless excuse for a love goddess, Aphrodite, growled Naruto, surprising the moon goddess at the anger in his tone. I'm sure you can agree how little she cares about anyone or anything, let alone the lives she ruins to make her little shipping fantasies come true. Even if one of the people whose life she ruins is already married. But I suppose that's expected when she constantly cheats on her husband, usually with his own damn brother most of the time. Yet I can still understand that it was forced on her by Hera, but she could have at least tried working something out with Hephaestus. Instead, she doesn't even try and just jumps into bed with arguably one of the scummiest gods to satisfy her bad boy fetish. And even with her being a love goddess, she's so superficial with her own love life, only caring about a guy's physical appearance regardless of what they're actually like, Naruto said, stopping to try and calm down a little, knowing if he got too angry, then someone was going to die. And then there's the numerous lives she's ruined for her shipping fantasies, like what she did with Atlanta. But I think one of the worst ones is what she did to Medea. She took an innocent girl and twisted her into a person regarded as a monster and a witch, someone to be blamed for every bad thing that happens just so everyone else can feel better about themselves, forcing her to love someone she never even met before, turning her against her own family, killing her brother, and cutting him into pieces just to distract her father, only to then be tossed aside by the person she was forced to love, being left with nothing but hatred and fear. It's not even surprising she decided to keep sinking until she hit rock bottom, as what else did she have? And all of that. Just because some human hero was favored by an even worse goddess Hera, Naruto spat in complete disgust and anger. She acts like she's so much better, that she's the scorned queen and wife of a known man whore. That she's simply getting justice for herself when she's just as bad, if not worse than him. She threw Hephaestus, her own son born from only herself, off of Olympus just because his physical appearance wasn't up to her standard. She drove Heracles insane and made him kill his own family, forcing him to do twelve labors to redeem himself adding two more after refusing to acknowledge two of them he had helped with or was paid for doing, simply out of spite. And then the numerous atrocities she's committed against every one of Zeus's demigods, none of whom ever asked to be born let alone decide who their father would be, along with their mothers, not caring if any of them were willing or simply raped because gods forbid he takes no for an answer, when he can just take what he wants, said Naruto, clenching his fists tightly while trying to contain his anger. And that's not even all of it. I could keep going about how both of them have ruined countless lives, like the Trojan War, which only began because they wanted some stupid apple, or what Aphrodite did to Smyrna, making her seduce her own father and then turning her into a tree before then sleeping with her son, after raising him as her own, or what Hera did to Hecate's daughter Lamia, turning her into a monster and killing her children. I could list everything they've done, but we'd be here for weeks if I did, but I'm sure you can see why neither of them has my respect or ever will, Naruto said before he then looked at Artemis. At least between the three of you, you're the better one of all three. But that isn't really saying much, is it? As believe me, there's still a lot of things you've done I could bring up, as well, said Naruto, with the moon goddess looking at him, unable to even describe all the emotions she's feeling right now. I, Artemis said, only to fall silent, not even sure what to say, still stuck on the realization of what she really did to Callisto and doing nothing to help Atlanta, despite how she followed and believed in the goddess. Do you even regret what you did to Callisto? Did you feel anything? 
Did you think of how she must have felt to be tossed aside? Or what about Atlanta? Do you regret not helping her when she was forced into an unwanted marriage? That she was then cursed and you did nothing? Have you ever even thought about either of them at all? Or did you just forget them once they were no longer your concern? Naruto asked, only for Artemis to flinch at each question, making the whiskered redhead scoff before he glanced over his shoulder at the hunters. They'd been speaking low enough so that none of them heard what was being said, which Naruto intended to do, as he may be a lot of things. But he wasn't going to break the pedestal Andromeda and the other hunters that were too young to know what really happened. Not when she's likely the only parent some of them have left. You can say whatever you want about me and the rest of the Asser that were arrogant, violent, bloodthirsty, whatever. I know who and what I am, along with the rest of my family. But you and your kind keep hiding behind your cloaks of righteousness. But I see all of you for what you truly are, said Naruto before brushing past Artemis, leaving the goddess standing there, much to the concern of her hunters. Ah. Uh, Lady Artemis? Andromeda said, looking at her in concern, wondering what he could have said to make her seem so, subdued. I, I need to take care of something girls, training's done for now. Zoe, make sure everyone gets back to the cabin, said Artemis before quickly teleporting away, needing to be alone and try gathering her thoughts, all while aware of the growing wetness in her eyes at realizing how much she hurt and failed those she was meant to protect, with Apollo. Meanwhile, Apollo had been traveling across America in search of the Bane of Olympus, while having sent copies of himself to check on his oracles. With the sun god, so far, not having any luck in locating where the Bane of Olympus could be hiding. Okay, let's think for a moment, the last time the Aphiotaurus appeared, it was killed by one of the Titans' allies in the first Titanomachy. So I doubt it'd be eager to actually join the Titans, especially since it'd just mean it would be killed again. And it probably knows if we find it, we'd probably kill it so the Titans can't burn its entrails. That means, if it hasn't already been captured, it's more likely to be hiding somewhere from both sides. But where, Apollo muttered while pacing around a forest, having been moving west towards Mount Othres, figuring the Titans would set up base there again and keep something as valuable as the Ophiotaurus there as well. Though Apollo was pulled from his musing as his eyes widened when he was suddenly covered in an aura of dark magic, freezing him in place. An ambush, Apollo thought, feeling he was unable to move from the surprisingly powerful magic before quickly working on breaking free. Teropolos, Bow of Heaven Apollo managed to break free just in time to see the sky light up with a dark violet light before he was shocked as hundreds of black and purple arrows began raining down all around him. Moving around and quickly dodging the arrows, Apollo summoned his bow and arrows. Drawing a few, the sun god instantly fired them into the sky, with the arrows multiplying into dozens of arrows made of light, colliding together in explosions of light and darkness. Machia Hikesha Gria Apollo grunted when a large beam of pure magic slammed down on top of him from behind sending the sun god crashing into the ground, leaving him open for the arrows falling from the sky to rain down and impale his body, only for Apollo to unleash a large explosion of light from his body, destroying the arrows and the magic blast, before he stood up, grunting as he did so, before he stumbled back when a black blur rushed past him, leaving claw marks across his chest. What the hell? What monster can move that fast? Apollo thought, looking at the claw marks in disbelief, before he instantly fired a barrage of arrows at where the blur went through the trees, only to be shocked when a purple magic circle appeared and actually managed to block his arrows. Arrow! Grunting again, Apollo suddenly felt the air and atmosphere around him shift around before a harsh wind began blowing around him, being sharp enough to rapidly slice through his body, before the sun god gagged his arrows were shot out of the trees at him, with three stabbing through his chest, two through his kneecaps, and one through his throat. Okay, starting to get really angry, Apollo thought ripping the arrows out, only for him to look at them in shock when he saw that they were made of silver. These are, said Apollo in shock and disbelief, knowing only his sister and her hunters used arrows like these. But before he could finish speaking, Apollo's eyes widened as he gasped in pain when he was stabbed in the back by what he guessed was a dagger, a strike he'd normally brush off like a bug bite, only to feel himself getting weaker. Oh, oh, that's not good, thought Apollo, looking down at his injuries that were no longer healing, or leaking ichor. Instead he only saw normal red blood before he collapsed to his hands and knees when the dagger was pulled out. While you aren't the target we were hoping for, I am pleased to see that Rule Breaker is effective against gods. It'll be so much more enjoyable watching Olympus crumble, while you all are little more than powerless humans, said a female voice as his attacker stepped in front of the weakened god, his eyes widening in disbelief at who it was. It was a woman with fair skin, long blue hair with a braid on the left side, matching blue eyes, and surprisingly pointed ears, wearing a long purple dress with darker purple sleeves and a slit going up the middle to her knees, a black choker, black sandals, black gloves, a long black cloak with dark gold trimming, and a smaller dark purple cloak over her shoulders with dark gold trimming, 
with both cloaks held together by a black and gold clasp. In her left hand was a magic staff, and in her other was the dagger, rule breaker she called it, with the god seeing the dagger with a strangely shaped, multicolored blade. But what shocked Apollo was that he recognized the woman, and she's supposed to be long since dead. Medea? Apollo muttered, wondering how she could be alive again, only to grunt in pain when someone landed on top of him, sending him crashing to the ground. It's disappointing. I was hoping Artemis would be the one we'd catch. But I suppose her precious twin will be a good substitute. It just means we can hurt her in a different way. Another female voice said as they got off of Apollo, allowing him to see who else and was once again shocked. The woman had deathly pale skin with a slight gray tint, yellow-green eyes with narrow slit pupils, and long, messy white hair with light purple bangs framing her face. Surprisingly, she had a pair of lion ears on top of her head and two lion tails emerging from her tailbone, wearing jet-black armor made from a mix of leather and armor with purple edging running along it, consisting of boots that went up to the bottom of her thighs, black underwear that were connected to the chest plate wrapping around her breasts leaving the underside of them exposed as well as her abdomen and sides, revealing a purple tattoo right above her crotch. Her arms were covered in long, clawed gauntlets that stretched up to her shoulders, connecting to large pauldrons with curved horns emerging from them, while in her hand was a matching black and purple bow, with Apollo recognizing who she was, another person that should be dead. Atlanta? Apollo said, not believing she's alive as well, only for his attention to turn to the sound footsteps, wondering who else could somehow be alive, only for the sun god to not be prepared when he saw who it was. It was another woman with fair skin, forest green slash hazel eyes, and long curly, dirty blonde hair with two long braids on either side of her face and a third wrapped around the back of her head, with the rest held in a long ponytail that went down her back. Her attire consisted of Greek silver sandals that wrapped up her calves, a dark pink sleeveless tunic that reached down to her thighs with a purple skirt underneath, green trimming around the collar and bottom of the tunic adorned with pink flower petal patterns. Over it was a familiar silver cloak that Apollo hadn't seen used in centuries. Even more familiar were the hunting knives strapped to her sides, the quiver of arrows on her back, and the silver bow in her hand. Ka Callisto? muttered Apollo in complete disbelief at seeing his sister's first lieutenant, while Callisto looked at him with cold, detached eyes. I wanted Artemis, but I suppose you'll do, said Callisto before drawing an arrow and aiming it at Apollo while Medea and Atlanta forced him to his feet and pushed him against a tree. Wait, we can talk about this, said Apollo, hoping they'd be willing to talk, especially since he was powerless at the moment, only to scream in pain when Callisto released the arrow, stabbing it through his right shoulder before drawing another one. No, we can't. Your father tried seducing me, disguised as my best friend and the woman I loved, Callisto said before shooting the second arrow through his left shoulder. When I refused, he simply didn't care, said Callisto drawing another arrow and shooting it through his right kneecap, making the sun god's screams grow louder. I cried, for hours when he finally left. I even contemplated ending my own life out of shame, Callisto said, shooting the next arrow into his left kneecap, leaving Apollo pinned to the tree. But I didn't. I returned to Artemis, hiding my shame as long as I could, because I couldn't tell her, said Callisto, shooting her next arrow into his elbow. I knew if I did. I would have to leave and then it'd only be a matter of time until Hera found out her rapist husband impregnated me, Callisto continued, with her next arrow going into Apollo's other elbow. Part of me was desperate to hope Artemis would understand when I couldn't hide it anymore, that she'd still keep me safe, said Callisto as her next arrow was shot into his foot. I learned she's just as cruel and uncaring as her father. She cast me out, turned me into an animal, and threatened to kill me if I returned, Callisto said, shooting her last arrow into his other foot with Apollo unable to scream anymore, only gasping and crying at the pain, having never experienced something like this before. Before Callisto strapped her bow to her back and pulled out one of her hunting knives, walking up to the powerless god and pressing it right against his crotch, much to Apollo's horror. It would have been mercy to just kill me, instead, but she chose to prolong my suffering. Now I only hope, she will soon feel a fraction of my pain, muttered Callisto before driving the knife straight into Apollo's crotch, with the sun god releasing a scream of pure agony. His agony only grew as Callisto began rapidly stabbing his crotch, slicing his genitals into pieces, feeling parts falling off. Soon, Callisto gained a broken smile and let out quiet, insane giggles. You can't rape any more women like me without this, can you? said Callisto as she saw Apollo begin turning into Zeus before giving a final swing of her knife and castrating the powerless god. She then ripped him off the tree and threw him on the ground straddling him as she held the knife against his face, her giggles growing louder as she now looked at Artemis. Isn't this familiar, Artemis? When we trained together, I was always able to beat you, but you'd always say you let me win. Are you letting me win now, sister? 
Callisto said, dragging the knife down Apollo's face from his forehead, down his jawline before pressing it against the corner of his mouth. I always did like it when you smiled at me, seeing how proud you were whenever I took down a monster or animal. Smile, Artemis, I want to see you smile, said Callisto, sticking the knife into Apollo's mouth and slicing open half of his face, only to growl in rage when Artemis vanished, and instead, she saw Zeus again making her slice right through his cheek roughly, smiling madly as he screamed. But I hate seeing you smile. I knew you weren't Artemis when you showed up wearing her face. Your smile is terrible, hideous, disgusting. I still remember you smiling the same smile when you were done and I was crying. I hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it. Callisto screamed, slicing open Apollo's mouth before viciously ripping the ruined flesh open even further. The sun god could only cry as his face was cut up and ripped open while Callisto blinked and saw Artemis again. You were crying then too. When you found out, you actually tried pretending you cared about me. You didn't care. You never did. I didn't want anything to do with your rapist father or have his bastard in me. I would have cut it out myself if I could. But you still cried when you said you'd kill me, when you turned me into an animal. But I saw what you really were. A monster. All of you are nothing but monsters. And you made me into this, all of you. Screamed Callisto as she could no longer tell who she's looking at anymore only seeing either Zeus, Artemis, Apollo, or a twisted mix of them, before she screamed loudly, with her scream sounding more like an enraged bear as her eyes turned pure black while her nails grew into claws. Callisto threw aside her knife and began furiously slashing her claws across Apollo's body, tearing off parts of flesh with her swings, before even lunging forward and biting down on his nose and tearing it off. Letting out a bear-like roar, Callisto stabbed her claws into his chest and ripped them down Apollo's body. When the enraged former hunter went to tear out Apollo's throat with her teeth, she was quickly grabbed and pulled off of him by Atlanta and Medea. Callisto, stop. You'll kill him. Medea said as they pulled away from the broken god, while Callisto thrashed in their arms. Her mind had begun reverting back to what it was when she was a bear, and right now, it only cared about blood. Sister, please calm down. Your anger is more than justified, but he's more valuable alive, said Atlanta, wrapping her arms around Callisto not caring if she hit her in the process, only caring about helping her calm down. No. No. Let me go. Let me go. Callisto screamed, panicking at being held down, making her thrash around even more, terrified that she's being touched and restrained. Atlanta and Medea instantly let her go, with Callisto scrambling away and grabbing her discarded knife, swinging it wildly at them with wide eyes. It's okay. It's okay. You're safe with us? No one will hurt you. Medea said softly as they got down on their knees in front of her to look less threatening, with Atlanta nodding in agreement. We promise, we only wish to help you, Callisto. We don't want to see you become the animal we know you're not. Just please let us help you, Atlanta said, slowly holding her hand out for Callisto, only for her to flinch and scoot away from them. Stop looking at me like that, said Callisto, seeing their soft expressions, the kindness and understanding in their eyes, the desire they had to want to help her. It made the former hunter want to cry already feeling tears in her eyes at the sight of their faces looking at her like that. Okay, okay, said Atlanta as they immediately stood up and turned around, letting Callisto breathe a little easier at no longer being looked at. I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm me, I'm still me, I'm strong, I'm safe, and no one can touch me unless I say so. I'm Callisto, I'm Callisto, and I'm a hunter, a hunter of my own, Callisto thought while taking a few deep breaths to calm herself down. Once she calmed down, Callisto stood up and sheathed her hunting knife with Atlanta and Medea turning towards her. I'm Fine. Let's just get him back before he ends up dying, said Callisto, motioning to Apollo, who'd since passed out from the pain. Nodding in response, the three went over to the powerless god, with Medea casting a stasis spell and some healing magic to ensure he couldn't move and to at least stop him from bleeding out, before the four dispersed into purple particles of light as Medea teleported them away. Thank you for watching. If you liked our video, please hit the like button. Subscribe for updates and follow our Twitter, info in description. Credits go to the story's author, with details below. Don't miss out on our other content, click on the suggested video for more stories and adventures. We appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you in our next video.